It's a year investors shouldn't really be afraid because so many positive changes are taking place. Um, the Fed is no longer fighting an inflation war, which means that they don't have to lean hard against the stock market or necessarily panic that financial conditions ease. Instead, I think the Fed just wants to keep the business cycle healthy. That gives them room to cut rates. So the one twist, I think this is going to be a back end loaded year, 2024. So I think more money is made in the second half of 2024. But our base case is really that the S&P is flat or down, you know, 5% or so in the first half. Tom Lee, managing partner and head of research at Fundstrat and FS Insight. It is so great to welcome you back on the show. Tom, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Merry well, Christmas, excited. happy holidays. Merry, Merry Christmas to you as well. And I'm excited to have you because, wow, it has been one heck of a year. And I was just looking back at your call for 2023 and you had a target of 4750 on the S&P and you nailed it. And so I was kind of hoping we could start maybe a bit of a retrospective, if you will, on 2023 and what really went right for your call there. Uh, well, you know, looking back, um, we had a lot of conviction this year. The market could be up more than 20%. Uh, in fact, by the fifth day, uh, we had highlighted that the probability of being up more than 20%, maybe as much as 25%, uh, was, was nearly 90%. I know it sounds crazy. Um, but there were two things, I think, that anchored our view. The first is... Many investors thought we were entering a decade of inflation problems, like similar to the 70s and 80s, which required the Fed to almost destroy the economy. And our base case was that inflation was actually transitory and was going to fall like a rock. Uh, we had spent a lot of time over the past year and a half highlighting how when you look at inflation, most of it was fueled by housing and cars. Even the services component, which they call core, actually has basically been driven by auto insurance and leasing cars. So it's all been housing and cars. It's actually almost 86% of all the excess inflation since 2019. Um, so that meant we thought inflation would actually sort of break to the downside, which it did. Uh, but the second was, I think investors underestimate the importance of um, volatility. You know, the VIX averaged over like nearly 30 last year, which has only happened three times in history. And almost every high volatility period was followed by a collapse in volatility. So we we expected the volatility to collapse this year, which it did. And in almost every case, stocks don't need inflows. They just need people to stop selling. And so I, I think mo what people got wrong mainly this year is they thought we were in for, you know, a 10 year period of pain and the Fed taking rates double digits. And we, you know, we thought the Fed would actually be done pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You're mentioning like what people got wrong. Why do you think so many got it wrong though? Uh, well, I think we need to ask them. Um, but if I guessed, I think there's a lot of punditry out there. Um, we haven't experienced inflation in our lifetimes really uh you know it very few investors were managing money in the 70s because that that would you know make them into their late 80s um so they don't you know most people don't have firsthand experience with inflation but we had a lot of pundits say oh well once inflation rises it's really hard to you know to come down and then the only period they can cite is the 70s and 80s which did have recurring inflation but the drivers of that inflation cycle were, were quite different. I mean, at the end of the day, if if we now look back, we realize, many people realize, but this was an argument that the supply chain and the bullwhip effect really created that initial inflation surge. And then the media helped fuel this idea that inflation would be sticky, which allowed people to raise prices and people to demand wages. But then as that psychology broke, inflation's now drifting lower. I mean, you know, even expectations have collapsed. I mean, the drop in inflation expectations on this US, like the UMICH surveys are, are things you only saw in 82. So we're already past the period when you see crisis level inflation expectations. So I think that's what people got wrong is that they focused on a singular analogy, but 
that happened during COVID as well. I don't know if you remember, but during the COVID, everybody went back to 1918 and said stocks would be stuck for a decade as well. And it turns out the COVID bottom was Mm V-shaped. I remember the last time you and I spoke and I, I learned so much in that episode, but one of the takeaways I had from listening to you was this notion of psychology and mass psychology playing a bigger role than ever. How much do you think that factored into it? Uh, oh, it's it's a it's a big factor. I mean, investing always has an emotional element to it, and today uh, expressing those emotions uh, through action is so easy because one, there's a lot of social media. Uh, two, it's just so easy to trade in and out of stocks, and and there's many tools now available for using leverage, including, you know, short dated options and futures contracts. So. Institutional investors, I think, have become a lot more uh, reflexive and uh, I think more dramatic in their repositioning. I mean, we we can see that in the prime brokerage data. Um, retail investors can obviously do that too. I mean, you know, six trillion dollars went into cash. I mean, stock market's up twenty percent this year, and you had two hundred forty billion dollars taken out of equities. That has never happened in history, but. On, on that point on psychology, because we survey our clients monthly with our Super Granny webinar, the positioning and expected returns of equity and bonds and what, what sectors are favored are pretty identical now between institutional and retail clients. So it shows you that the market is kind of reading from the same playbook too. And that that's why I think it it's paid for us to be a little contrarian uh, in terms of market psychology. No, 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 no. Well, you mentioned um, the, that it's almost identical between institutional and retail investors reading from the same playbook. What, can you explain that real quick? When, is, that, is that normal that they are or is that a little bit different? I think it should, historically it's usually quite different. Um, <clears throat> you know, Historically, institutional investors um, have a longer time horizon and so groups that they will favor and, and asset class expectations, like the expected return for S&P over six to 12 months, generally should reflect fundamentals or it should be more consistent with historical ranges. For instance, uh, hey, if rates are bottoming, you want to be long cyclicals, you know, um, an early cycle. And... Uh, you know, retail, I think, tends to be more momentum driven, like, you know, whatever's working that they want to overweight. Well, th- that should be pretty divergent when you do surveys. But really what we found this year is that the, the survey answers are about the same. I mean, what shocked me the most is when you when we ask investors, what's your expected return for equities in the next 12 months? The most common answer, usually it's over 50%, expect zero to 5%. Now that, the reason that is not, cannot be the answer is that in the last 130 years, that only encompasses 11% of outcomes. Like, so people are picking the least probable thing and expecting the stock market to only be up five, you know, less than cash. Uh, in fact, the most proper answer should be most people should say plus 10 or better because that happens 57% of the time. Yeah. Okay. So the call for 2023, 4750. I mean, I'm looking at S&P futures, even as we're recording this and 4783, we still have um, the rest of the year to play out, but amazing, amazing call on your end. So a lot of folks, Tom, are probably going to ask you about your 2024 outlook. And I want to pass it back to you and give you as much time as you'd like to frame up the 2024 call. Uh, Yeah. Well, I mean, 2024, I think, You know, it's an investor, it's a year investor shouldn't really be afraid um, because so many positive changes are taking place. Um, The Fed is no longer fighting an inflation war, uh, which means that they don't have to lean hard against the stock market or necessarily panic that financial conditions ease. Instead, I think the Fed just wants to keep the business cycle healthy. And right now, um, that gives them room to cut rates. I think the second positive change next year is we are in an earnings recovery cycle. Uh, earnings bottomed in the third quarter, excluding energy up 10% and, and the PMIs are bottoming. That leads to cyclical earnings recovery. 
Plus, you know, as you know, the economy is shifting more towards goods, which helps S&P earnings. And then Europe and China could recover. So I think that the earnings backdrop is quite good. And you mentioned positioning. You know, people took a lot of money out of stocks. I think they're going to look at their statements and realize, well, I, I could have made way more money if I just kept my money in the stock market. So I think that money comes out of money markets and goes back into equities. Um, so I think overall that keeps the market well supported. But I think there's going to be a couple of big changes. Um, the first is I don't think it's going to be as narrow. Um, and that's what we spend a lot of time in our outlook talking about that if you were to make, you know, uh, a belief that the probability favored market breadth expansion, then you got to be overweight small cap stocks. So small caps are number one sector pick next year. Uh, on a price to book basis, small caps have never been cheaper than the to the S&P. And it's only been once in 1999. <clears throat> and that was the start of a 12 year period where small caps outperformed the S&P. So I think we're at the right launching point for small caps to have a huge year. That's why it's our number one pick. Um, we also think one of the big stories is that interest rate, I don't know the direction of interest rates, but next year I think the tenure has a lot of room to come down. And that should also bring down mortgage rates. So it's I think it's important to be overweight groups that are leveraged to lower interest rates or a recovery in housing. And, you know, the most obvious to me are regional banks and, and large cap banks. Regional banks helps the small caps too, because they're such a big part of the Russell 2000. But for financials, uh, you know, you have a lot of upside because you've got a balance sheet recovery, a credit quality recovery, even potentially improved demand for credit because I'll explain that in a second, but there's a lot of pent up capex and there's a valuation expansion opportunity. So I think financials are our number one large cap sector pick, followed by industrials and then technology, FANG. So I don't think people should bet on FANG and tech to be the best group next year. I think it's going to be more the JP Morgan and the Goldman's and the Blackstones and the Black Rocks, et cetera. Um, and then you might wonder, well, what can, why would the economy do better? One thing to keep in mind is we, and we covered this in our outlook, there was a pretty large gap between like what soft surveys, like, hey, uh, NFIB, small business, what do you expect for growth? And it was always cautious. Or you look at ISM and those readings were cautious compared to the actual hard data, which stayed strong. <clears throat> so that gap was pretty big between small and large, uh, soft and hard data. And since 1960, there are four times when you had the same situation where the economic data held up, but the survey data showed people were really cautious. Four, four times there was a CapEx recovery because people, when they get cautious, they under order, they don't expand. But then if the hard data was correct, then they have to start spending next year. So I think next year is a CapEx cycle. Um, and as you know, that's upside to earnings, to industrials, but that actually helps financials because of course, CapEx is consuming more credit. So the one twist I think I we have is that I think a, this is going to be a back end loaded year, 2024. So I think more money is made in the second half of 2024. <clears throat> and, you know, stocks probably best case, well, stocks could just go straight up too. Um, but our, our base case is really that the S&P's is flatter down, you know, 5% or so in the first half. Explain that. Like why the base case down or flat, down 5% or flat in the first half and why the back end of the year? Yeah, there's um, there's four things and it's uh, it's not fully sort of vetted out in my, my mind, but I think this all largely plays out in the first half, which is, I do think consensus and sentiment are improving into the end of this year. So I think that there's a chance we still have a parabolic move the next two weeks. Because um, we published something last night that showed when you look at large cap fund managers, 35% are missing their benchmark this year, um, which is way above 
average underperformance, typically 40, oh, you know, 40, sorry, 35% are beating, 65% are missing. And in a typical year, it's more like 55% are missing. So it's 10 percentage points more underperforming their benchmark. And that means they're likely to chase stocks into year end. Um, and of course, we know that there's been outflows from retail. And so that I think could fuel a pretty big move the next two weeks. Parabolic moves, I mean, they end. So I, I think that you're going to have some correction from that. Um, the second is, I do think it's possible that you're, we're more likely to have a growth scare in the first half because at some point next year, people, investors are going to get anxious for when the Fed might cut. And so the pressure and the anxiousness about when the regime change starts could actually be muddled with the idea that economic data could be weakening too. And so people will be worried that this is a hard landing and the Fed might make a mistake. So I think that that anxiety happens in the first half. And then the third thing is that um, I, I, I think AI, which was a, carried a lot of stocks this year, becomes kind of a practical question, you know. And I don't know if that momentum is that's going to mean that in the first half of next year we have a wave of AI innovation. I, I think it's more likely that that timing gets pushed out. And that, and that hurts the large cap tech, which kind of, I think, would hurt the S&P. I think that small caps could actually just rally through this whole period too. So it might just be best place to be in the first half is small caps. Hey there, I just want to quickly interrupt the video and just say thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this channel and choosing to watch this interview. I hope that you are enjoying it and I appreciate you visiting the channel. If you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. It's totally free and it will keep you up to date on all of my interviews. I post two interviews a week with some of the most incredible people in, in finance and investing and your support will help me bring in some more amazing guests. If you already are one of my subscribers, thank you so much. I cannot express to you how much your support means to me. I am incredibly grateful that I get to do something that I'm truly passionate about. And you being there week after week, it not only gives me that energy, but it just gives me that faith to keep going. And it means everything to me. And I love seeing you all in the comments section. I love interacting with you. I love interacting with you on email or social media. I just love hearing from you all. And I just appreciate your support so much. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do something that I just love. So I just want to say thank you and appreciate you subscribing. All right, back to the interview. Oh, God. Okay. That, so yeah, I see. Uh, all right. So the outlook there's within the back half of the year, but maybe the first half flat or down um, and some fears around like the economy and is that a hard landing playing out? So small caps. is. Why why small caps though is just just out of curiosity because I feel like they have been kind of unloved of late. Oh man, they've been horrible for the last three years. So I don't blame anyone for not loving them, right? Um, because they've been a drag on people's performance. Mm -hmm. well, well, and some have even said that some of them are zombies or they haven't been profitable and things like that. Yeah, but those are unfair characterizations. I mean, anyone who's, you know, I used to be a small cap strategist. Um, the Russell 2000 historically only has, I think, 70% of its companies profitable. So it's the way these indices, the Russell's construct is just basically market cap size, but it doesn't really, it's not a problem that there's that many non-profitable companies because that's always, that's the history of the index. Um, what really matters to small caps is, I would say macro factors, like one, you need retail inflows if people are taking money out of the stock market, they're not putting money into any Russell 2000 small cap index. So that's why you've had such a drainage out of small cap and a, and a collapse in valuation. Price to book, again, is where it was in 99 versus large cap. And that was the bottom. Um, the second is small cap companies tend to have higher cost of money and are generally more levered. So this tight money has just punished small cap businesses and um, that's kind of reversing. 
And then, of course, you know, soft landing isn't a great scenario for uh, small caps. But if if we're entering expansion, right, economic momentum has been slowing for three years. If it starts to stabilize or improve, that's a huge tailwind for a small cap. So I, I think people are, they need to really study history. I, I think like when, when people say small caps are full of zombie companies, it's always been filled with zombie companies, you know. And like, I just remember earliest year because we, you know, we, you know, like, when the regional banks had problems, that was a chance for the market to have a black swan moment, a credit event like 09, and, and it didn't happen. So I just think there has to be a lot more humility for the doomsayers because we've had a war this year. Um, you know, we've had oil spikes last year and we had a credit event and yet the S&P survived and credit spreads have rallied. So, you know, if someone's trying to hold on to a bearish tree saying, well, eventually this all comes to roost, I, I think that, that that's a really terrible way to try to manage money. Okay. On your call, um, can you put a number on it for 2024? Because, okay, 4750 for 2023. Do you have a number oh, in yeah, mind uh, for 2024? I think next year, uh, S&P can close 5200 52. Yeah, but I I do think that it's you know you 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 know people will get a chance to you know at S and P forty like forty four forty three hundred sometime next year in the early part of next year. So that's yeah. why I think you, you know the first half might might be well. I think for small caps it'll be fine because I think small caps could be up as much as fifty percent next year. But uh, I think it's going to be a little tougher for uh, the large cap index. Got it. That's interesting. Okay. So 5,200 for the year, possibly 4,300 we could see in the early part and small cups, you think you'll be fine and could be up as much as 50% in the year. Do you, is there a moment where, okay, I, you mentioned in the conversation, the financials being interesting industrials. Do you want to be there now? Or is that kind of, you want to wait till more of the back half of the year? How are you thinking about playing the scenario, if you will? Uh, Yeah, I think financials work from the beginning of the year. Um, you know, they're under-owned. I mean, it's not like a lot of people are bragging that they're long financials right now, you know? Um, they, they've been one of the worst groups. And I know Goldman Sachs prime brokerage data shows hedge fund positioning is like the lowest, I think, in almost 10 years in financials. So if if we start the year overweight groups that people don't own, there's less punishment if the market has problems in the first half. And you still and you still want to have you still also want to be in technology. It's just not going to have the same run like we saw yeah, this year. I, I, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's top three on the large cap. It's just number three. So it's it's still something that I think I mean technology companies are going to grow earnings faster than the S P. And I don't think multiples have to contract for tech. It's just that there's less juice in the in the thesis because there's less room for surprise um but you know i i i mean the only time you really want to sell technology is if we're going to have i mean you know a couple of reasons one if there was actually a hard landing and companies were going to slash capex but um and that you know then you you really just want to be in cash and the second would be if somehow an ai revolution doesn't require consumption of more technology services, which we know is not the case. But if, if you ever reach the point where AI doesn't need to buy data center capacity and semiconductor chips and software engineers, then then it's kind of a bad story. But, you know, of course, I don't see that. So I don't, I don't think people should ever have a zero weight in tech. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You know, um, oftentimes in probably unfairly so, you you get called a perma bull and like a lot of folks get called perma bears and whatnot, but it sounds like there's also a lot of nuance too. And I've heard you describe yourself as more of a contrarian. Can you like address when folks call you a perma bear or not? So excuse, excuse me, a perma uh, bull. Uh, I just think, I think it's a cheap shot. I think it's really lame when people say that actually. Um, and it's actually kind of dumb because it comes from people who've missed this year. I mean, the accountability is 
How many fund managers told you to be in cash this year when the market's up 25%? That's a catastrophe because that's if, if they, our number one sector pick this year was FANG, which is up 99%. That's 20 years of money market gains if you were long FANG. So who, who really cost that investor money? Now, the cheap shot is, oh, Tom's a permable but we recommended Fang. Do you really think that's a permeable view or was that a tactically correct argument to be overweight Fang? It's laughable to me that someone calls me a permeable. I think they're called perma wrong. Um, and secondly, you can look at our track record. Our client loyalty is incredible. You can look at, it's our institutional business. We barely lose customers. And then look at our FS Insight business, which we just launched couple years ago, we have 500 Google reviews. Almost everyone's a five star talking about how much we saved their portfolio or we saved their retirement. It wasn't from being permeable. It was actually from being right. I think it is really dumb for someone to call us a permeable. It's because they're, they haven't made their clients money. We've made our clients rich. So I don't, I don't really care if someone calls it permeable, but Look, we upgraded small caps about a month ago, and look, they're up almost 30%. So someone could have earned six years of returns in just buying small caps for eight weeks versus being in money market. So for those who put their money in cash because they listened to the bears or the, hey, Tom's a permable, so I'm not going to listen to him, you cost yourself a lot of money. I mean, we've made... None of our clients are below the 20, they're, they're way above 2022 levels because they might've lost 20% last year, but then they made 99% in FANG. I mean, so many of our clients are ahead of the game and I, I think it's almost laughable. Yeah, I like perma wrong. And also um, 2024, that's your 10th year in business, I believe. So congratulations on the 10th anniversary. Yeah, thanks. We have clients so in 26 countries. So it's we have incredible. a lot of uh, interesting conversations. You know, one of the things I love about listening to you is just how much I learn, especially I always feel like you come with such knowledge of like history of markets. And uh, it's just fascinating when I'm li like listening to you. What do you, what do you look at or how's your process? Can you help us like give us a peek into your process and maybe how it's evolved over the years? Uh, Well, we're th there's a lot to it. I mean, first, uh, you know, I'm really well read. Um, my pace of reading slowed because we've been so busy, but you know, I used to read close to three or four books a month. Uh, almost all are historical nonfiction because I do think history is the way, really the most important way to understand society. Um, but it's also helped create thematic research for us. You know, most of our work is thematic, uh, meaning we do demographic studies. You know, we were very early in identifying the importance of cryptocurrencies because we saw the disruption that millennials had uh, sort of their dislike towards banks. Um, and so that's why, was it seven years ago now? We started- 2017, writing. yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, we were very early on, even like AI because of labor shortage, we started writing about that in 2018 and we added NVIDIA to our granny shots list in 2019. Um, which of course has been a monster. In fact, Granny Shots, which is our core stock list, which encompasses all our thematic work, is up like 33% this year, something like that. And it's outperformed the S&P every single year for the last five years. There's not been a year it's underperformed the market. Um, and the cumulative outperformance is now, it's pretty staggering, it's like 100%. So I think thematic, research is really what we're known for. Um, and that means also listening to credit and understanding like internals. Um, I think one of our big advantages in the last year and a half was we studied inflation really at the 32 component level. And we were absolutely convinced core inflation was going to undershoot consensus. We're not economists, but we could show all the data sets from 1950 showing that when you're in the same situation where it's just housing and cars, those are just mean reversion. Car prices aren't going up, you know, used car prices could fall 30%, but I, it was amazing how most people could not 
accept that and they were data dependent just looking at year over year CPI. So I, I think that gave us a huge advantage over the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, cryptocurrencies research that you all were early on that 2017. Bitcoin's been on a tear lately. What, what's your thesis on Bitcoin? Uh, well, I mean, you know, it is the most secure way to move money, uh, hands down. You know, there hasn't been, you know, since the inception of Bitcoin now, which is going to be entering its 15th year, um, of the, let's say, 80 trillion of, it's probably more than that, like 100 trillion of transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, right, on the ledger, not a singular fraudulent entry. In that same period of time, 6% of all banking activity is suspicious. The tailwinds for Bitcoin next year are really two, but they're two, you can't even ignore them. The first is uh, monetary policy is flipping. Central banks are really flipping dovish. You, you've never had a down cycle in crypto when the Fed's easy. And the second is that there's uh, really a, a way to on-ramp more customers because a Bitcoin spot ETF is likely to get approved. I love how people think that that's not an upside story. You know, it's a $2 trillion asset class that you can't really access through your 401k today. But if, if, if you make it available through a spot ETF, remember US households have like $170 trillion of investable capital. The multiplier into Bitcoin is, well, it depends, but, you know, because it's so much, it's, it's a curve, but it's four times or five times. So, you know, if, if people put 1% of their 401k into Bitcoin, you know, we're, you're overwhelming supply of Bitcoin. So I, I think Bitcoin, you know, could have a very strong year next year. Well, I have to say, Tom, it has been an absolute pleasure having you back on the show and just getting to listen and learn learn from you. I do want to give you a few minutes. Uh, do you want to let folks know where they can find more of your work, um, subscribe to your research, or follow you on social media? And any parting thoughts, anything that we didn't bring up in this conversation that you'd like to share with the audience, please take the next few minutes to do so. Uh, sure. Well, if you're an RIA or... Uh, just as someone who's really interested in stocks, you should find you should really join our subscription service at fsinsight.com. And um, you know, I think it's really good value. You get daily videos from me and Mark Newton, our technician, as well as cryptocurrency research and policy from Sean Farrell and Tom Block. Um, we are running a special with gift cards right now, so you'd actually save almost 25% off your annual service if you sign up through the gift card. Uh, again, you just do it through the website. But uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn, you can find us on Twitter at Fundstrat um, or on uh, LinkedIn. But again, oh, one last thing, FS Insight has an app. That's really where we really engage our customers because um, we do a lot of internal flashes and you have a lot of internal conversations for myself and Mark. And this is where we have instant reaction to headlines. And last week, I know our clients said it, it, it really helped them enormously because we had instant reaction to the FOMC and, and really how to express a positive view from what we saw. So uh, I hope everyone has a great holiday, but I think you also have to stop listening to these perma perma wrongers i love it well tom lee managing partner and head of research at fundstra and fs insight thank you so much for being so generous with your time your ideas all of your knowledge really appreciate you and merry christmas tom merry christmas <laughs>